Everybody's dressed so pretty and men handsome. It just looks great. We're here to worship the Lord and to celebrate Christmas. Amen? Amen. And we're so glad you're here. We welcome you to our service. We have guests here today. And don't forget the orange folder at the end of the pew. Sign your name and the information asked for and pass it along so that we can get the names of all those that are in our worship today and any of our guests, then we can appropriately welcome them and thank them for having come to our service today. Let's stand together as we open our service in a word of prayer. Loving Father, we're so thankful for the Christmas season. God, we're thankful for the hope that wells up within us. We're thankful for the deep-seated peace and joy that's in our hearts because we've received that first Christmas morning gift the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, into our hearts and lives. What a difference Jesus has made in us. And we've come today to celebrate his birth. We've come, Lord, to remember his life and to remember the sacrifice he made that we all might have abundant life here and hope of everlasting life in the future. Father, we just pray today your blessing upon each individual that's come, each family that's represented. We simply ask that the anointing of your Holy Spirit will be upon us, O God. Everything that's said and done, O God, strengthen us and enable us that we can bring proper joy and glory to your holy name. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to ask that those who are involved come for our fourth Sunday of Advent, the candle of peace. Today we light the fourth candle on the Advent wreath. This is the candle of peace. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. John 14, 27. The world offers packages of peace that come with limited guarantees. The peace of Christ will last forever. The gift is admired, the wrapping paper discarded, and the tinsel swept away but the peace of Christ is new each morning. Like the newborn baby nestled snugly in his mother's arms, your peace causes us to rest in you. Just as the shepherds knelt reverently before you, we bow grateful hearts for the peace that floods our souls and lifts our spirits. While the candles gently flicker, we recall the warm, brilliant light of the star that still leads us to Bethlehem. The sweet strains of the songs the angels sang gives us glimpses of your glory and majesty. Jesus said, I have told you these things that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Remind us when we find ourselves in turmoil, you are our peace. When we feel anxious and fearful, help us seek your peace. When we feel neglected and lonely, assure us of your peaceful presence. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you have sheltered us from many storms and been our song in the night. You have dried our tears and calmed our fears and shown us love we do not deserve. We don't take these peaceful moments for granted, but cherish every opportunity to join with family and friends to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. We pray for our brothers and sisters all over the world who risk their lives to serve you and share your peace with others. We ask you to encourage and protect them as they win souls to the kingdom of God. Let this season inspire us 
to seek peace and pursue it. We worship and adore you, for you alone are worthy to be praised. Truly, you are our peace. Amen. Now we will take up our Christ's birthday offering. And after I pray, I would like for everyone to come down the center aisle. Come out of the pews into the center aisle. Come down. Those of you who are prepared to give and place your Christ's birthday offering in the manger that's here below the communion table. Then return to your seats by way of the outside aisle. So you'll come down the center aisle. Then after placing the offering, you'll go back the outside aisles. Let us stand together for a word of prayer. Shall we pray? Messiah, Emmanuel, Jesus, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, fully human, fully divine, we praise your holy name and offer up these gifts in thanksgiving for all you are and for all you do. We ask for your help to live humbly and simply with your grace and truth and love guiding us. As we behold your glory anew this Advent season, come Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Excellent is excelsis. Y'all can give your offering. Those are prepared to.
I just want to say this special singing is done by our Bible surfers, and I'm so proud of them. They're going to sing another one. Praise the Lord.
Mary, did you know that your baby boy would they walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm a storm with his head? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels run? When you kiss your little baby, you've kissed the face of God. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, and the dead will live again. The lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the That your baby boy is Lord of all creation. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? This sleeping child you're holding is the great I beautiful Christmas songs ever written. I just love that. And when I think that Mark Lowry wrote it, I can't hardly believe it. (laughs) He's such a comic, great singer, great man. But to think that a song like that could come from him, it's amazing. That's how the Holy Spirit inspires his people in just a beautiful song. And Wayne, thank you for how well you shared that with us today. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 2. Last Wednesday night, Sister Absher said, Honey, I I wish you would share on stones of remembrance from Joshua 4. I said, For Christmas? She said, Yes. She said, We should establish stones of remembrance in our families, traditions that will keep ever before our children the true meaning of Christmas. And so I shared with the Wednesday night group from Joshua 4 and the 12 rocks that the 12 tribes were told to get out of the River Jordan and to build as a monument uh, stones of remembrance for God's deliverance and taking them in to the promised land. And I told them that my most favorite stone of remembrance. And by the way, Ninian requested I share this Thursday at our seniors meeting, so Joy and Doug and Sister Absher and Ninian heard again. (laughs) 
But my favorite remembrance was when my daddy would take his worn Thompson chain Bible and sit down in the living room and have all the grandchildren and great-grandchildren come and sit at his feet. And he would read them the Christmas story. And then he would ask them whose birthday it is. And of course, they'd all start jumping, saying, Jesus' birthday, Jesus' birthday. And then he'd have them sing, Happy Birthday to Jesus. That was always a special time. Daddy's been gone. This will be the eighth Christmas, seven years, but the eighth Christmas that he's been gone from us. And different ones of us have tried to assume his role, never quite filling his shoes because of his life and ministry and what he meant to our family and continues to mean to our family today. So I want you to turn to Luke chapter 2 this morning. And I want you to listen to the message that Dad always read to our family on Christmas Eve. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. He went to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that Mary should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem. And see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard this story wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Verse 11 to me is one of the most glorious announcements that human ears have ever heard. Tremendous message to humanity. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Let that sink into your hearts and spirit today and in the days to come. 
unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Shall we pray? Loving Father, this time of the year is so special to me. Not only because of the heritage that I enjoyed through my Christian father and mother and the stones of remembrance that they established for us in the home that we will never forget. Especially, O oh God, the reading of Luke 2. How, Father, it's inspired us again and again and there's so many messages in these verses that encourage us in our walk of faith. God, we thank you this morning that we can look together for a moment at the most glorious announcement that human ears have ever heard. For unto you is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus. Oh, God, may we never take it for granted. May it always be the most special gift that we've ever received. And may our lives reflect our love to you, our service to you, our giving to you, because of how much you gave on that first Christmas morn. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In this passage of Scripture, we have the most important words from God the Creator to the created. All of us who receive this message, it's the best news that we could ever hear. The angel simply announced, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now why is this the greatest announcement that human ears could ever hear? Why is it the most important message that we celebrate this Christmas season? It was the most important message because the world needed a Savior. Amen. The world needed a Savior. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible also says that because we've sinned, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. In other words, we cannot help ourselves spiritually. We cannot be good enough. We cannot go to church enough. We cannot sing enough, tithe enough. We cannot attend revivals enough or preach enough. We cannot witness enough to ever merit salvation. So this message that a Savior was born was a needed message by the world. Not only that, it was a needed message by people who were religious you see, the religious people of Jesus' day and of this day still need a Savior. Amen? They still need a Savior. Turn with me to Romans chapter 7. And let's look together at the fact that the religious need a Savior. Let's look beginning at verse 15. And this is the Apostle Paul's testimony before his Damascus Road experience when he met Jesus and was wonderfully saved through faith in Him. Notice Paul's testimony as a Pharisee. He had committed his life to keeping the letter of the law. He was the most revered sect in Judaism. Because he was fervent in his faith. And yet he says in verse 15, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would that I do, for what I would that do I not, but what I hate that I do. 
If then I do that which I would not, I consider unto the law that it's good. Now then it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He was born a sinner like all of us were. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Paul says, as a Jew, as a Pharisee, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then he gives the answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, Jesus is not only the Savior of the world, He's Savior of all religious people. Because our religion will not save us. Our good deeds will not save us. We need to be transformed. Old things need to pass away. And behold, all things need to become new as we receive the Christ into our heart and life. He says, To as many as receives me, to them I give power to become the sons and daughters of God. No wonder there was a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and singing, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. The promised Messiah had come. The Savior of the world was in that little cradle. Oh, Mary, did you know what it meant to humanity and what it means to us today? That glorious announcement is something to get happy about. I can't read the Christmas story without joy bubbling up within me because I know it's only through Christ that I'm going to heaven. It's only through Jesus that I can live a holy life through the power of His Holy Spirit. It's only through Jesus that I can make it all the way because He's my advocate at the right hand of God. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Why do we get happy about the Christmas story? Because this announcement is personal. Our text says, it's to you, and it's to me. Think of that. It's to you, and it's to me. No one's unimportant to God. It's for each one of us, and it's timely. It's today. (laughs) The Bible says today is the day of salvation, not yesterday or the year before or ten years back what our relationship was. God is concerned about what it is today. Amen. Where we are today. And it's important because Jesus is the only Savior of this world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father except by Him. In this announcement of good news, the words you and this day and the Savior contain the whole Christmas story. And I want us to look at them closely together. The angel said simply, to you is born this day a Savior. The glorious announcement of Christmas is for everybody. It's for the wino in the streets of Chicago or New York. It's for the homeless in our major cities. It's for the murderers. It's for the abusers. 
It's for the Hitlers. It's for everybody. No one's exempt. If we will receive the good news, it's for you. It's for the homosexual and the lesbian. It's for the immoral. It's for the sinful. It's for all of us. Verse 10 says, The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Whosoever will may come. There are no big eyes and little U's. There's no strata of economics. The poor and the rich, the mighty, and those that aren't so strong can hear the words, unto you is born this day a Savior. Aren't you glad it doesn't matter who we are? <laughs> it doesn't matter who we are. I think of the humble beginnings in my life and the places where we lived, and the hand-me-downs that we wore to school, and how embarrassed I would be at times when the druggist's son would walk up before my friends and say, Wayne, how do you like my jeans and shirt you've got on? <laughs> you know, children don't realize how hurtful some things can be. And of course, I'd say, I like them, Charles. His name was Charles Toller. And I said, I thank you so much for letting me wear them. Now, humble beginnings. But still in a revival meeting at eight years of age, unto me was born a Savior. And he changed my life. <laughs> he continues to change my life. I told Sister Absher yesterday, I said, we're the most blessed people on the face of the earth. We love each other. We love the Lord. Our children love us, and they love the Lord. I said, how blessed can a person be? And Jesus has made the difference. Amen? He's made the difference. It doesn't matter what we've done. There's no sin too big or grievous, but God will forgive you. And wipe your slate clean. Not a single person has to go wanting during this Christmas season or any time of the year because Jesus came. Think about it. For your sake, God was not content, content to be God, but willed to become a man. Not only that, he became an infant, a baby in the arms of Mary. It's so hard to get our minds around that. To think that the God who spoke this world into existence, everywhere present, all-powerful, limited himself, emptied himself, and became a little baby, and grew up facing temptation as we do, yet without sin. It was for you and for me that Jesus emptied himself that you and I might be filled with his spirit. Isn't that awesome? Jesus was emptied that we might be filled, praise God, with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Praise God, it, it was for you and for me that Jesus died. He took our place that you and I might live. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you did for us all. Now, secondly, the angel said to you is born this day a Savior. This glorious announcement of the gospel, now hear me, this is important, is always a present tense experience. We can't rest on past laurels. 
I can't rest on the heritage my father and my mother has left for me. Can't rest in that. I can't rest in what happened when I was here years ago <laughs> as your pastor. I can't rest on what I've done this past year. It's what's my relationship to Jesus today. Today. The scripture says today is the salvation, is the day of salvation. Salvation is always today. It's always a present tense experience. You say, what do you mean, Brother Absher? Turn with me to Ezekiel. And I want you to listen to what the Bible says. It's so clear and how anyone could confuse this issue is beyond me. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 18 and let's begin reading at verse 20. You don't have to be a theologian to understand this. We make it so complicated. The Bible says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Now notice, But if the wicked will turn <coughs> from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. See, salvation's a today experience. It's not the past, it's today. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall, be, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Now notice the next verse. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed and in his sin that he has sinned. In them shall he die. God simply saying, salvation is a today experience. For the wicked that sinned yesterday, he can be forgiven today. For the righteous man that lived righteously and is now living wickedly, he will die in his wickedness, lost and undone. It's where we are today that matters. Not if we were baptized 40 years ago. Not if we joined churches 20 years ago. It's where are we today in relationship to the Savior of the world. The real question is what is our relationship with Jesus in the here and now? We should not wait to make a decision for Christ for now is the appointed time. We're told elsewhere in God's Word, Oh, that today you would hearken to God's voice and harden not your hearts. Now finally this morning, the angel said to you is born this day a Savior. Aren't you glad? A Savior. Listen to Jesus' own words when he said simply, I came not to condemn the world, but that the world through me might live. Praise God forever. Jesus did not come to condemn us. He came to impart new life and new power through the Holy Spirit that we can live righteous lives. In addition, the word proclaims that it was while we were yet sinners 
that Jesus died for us. In other words, at the ugliest point in our life, Jesus loved us so much that he paid the price of Calvary for us all. My friends, Jesus loves us this morning. And he wants to save us from so many things. Can I say to you this morning, if you're living in any sin, Jesus wants to save you. If you're living with any sin in your life, Jesus wants to save you today. May I say, if you've slipped back from Jesus, from past experiences when you were living close to him, if you've backslidden, Jesus wants to save you today. He wants to forgive you. If you're living a lukewarm life, not on fire for Christ, not burdened for the lost, Jesus wants to save you today. Did you know if your family is on the brink of ruin, Jesus died to save our families? He doesn't want us to divorce. He wants us to forgive one another and let him be the focal point of our lives. Now, if we've divorced, he wants us to establish the relationship we're in now according to his word and live until death do us part. He can save the sick today. That's why we anoint and pray. That's why we have prayer lists because we believe that our Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We believe that by His stripes, healing is imparted to the body of Christ. And then finally, and this is the hope that I continue to hold out, Jesus can save our nation. He can save our nation. As bad as things may look, as far as America has backslid, with all the immorality we see displayed on every hand, people talk about controlling guns. We need to control our wills. We need our natures under the control of the Holy Spirit. What godly man would go into a school and take the lives of innocent children? Not one. What person who has Christ living in him would do the shameless things that are done in our society? Not one. Because Christ in us changes us and makes us the kind of people God created us to be. So in closing this morning, I ask, won't you hear this glorious announcement of good news and respond to it today as needs are represented in your life? Just think about it. You can this day have a Savior for whatever need is represented in your life. You can this day have a safe.